no positive assertion on the methodology of Nagarjuna may be made, especially after denying that there is any consistent use of neither logic nor dialectic to educe ultimate truth, or tattva. However, if a phraseology were to be coined, it might be termed, quote, the way of sunya, and this way is termed by some Asian as well as Western scholars as the logic of sunya. Thus termed, the logic must be one of showing the way to the ultimate understanding that sunya is the realized content of all experiential components or dharma because of the contingent dynamics of nature or pratya samputpada. It is a, quote, method only in the sense of exhibiting the whys and wherefores of all views, proper or improper, and of asserting the thusness of experiences as such, or yathaputam. To be sure, the karika are difficult to read and understand because the method of criticizing any view to its logical necessity and thereby to exhibit its absurdity is basically an exercise in seeing the proper relationship between the twofold aspect of truth. This is to say, the reader must be able to distinguish between the realms of empirical relative truth and of non-empirical supreme truth. He or she must, as it were, be able to shift his gears of ontological understanding. The phrase, quote, ontological understanding, close quote, seems redundant, but it is used advisedly in the sense that there is an understanding with reference to the existential or sentient nature of the individual. This nature generally has not been accorded its due import in the past, since sentient creatures usually forget the basis of their own existence and tend to run off into the clouds of intellection, becoming increasingly unmindful of the totality of the nature of things. Naturally, the concept of sunyata is with reference to the supreme nature of truth. But this does not mean that the concept is not relatable to the empirical nature of truth. The key concept here is, as mentioned earlier, relational origination, or pratitya samutpada. It is a so-called bridge concept which spans both realms of truth. It presents a unique perspective of reality, or bhavha, and permits the perceptive one to have glimpses of the relational structure of being on the one hand, and of the voidness, or sunyata, of being on the other. However, the empirical and non-empirical realms are not coexistent in all respects from the beginning in the mundane world, although admittedly the karika state quite cryptically, that in the ultimate sense the samsaric and nirvanic realms are identical. One can only see reality and relate it from the empirical standpoint, to be sure, but this standpoint requires a relentless discursive analysis of the mind and its functions. It is basically an exercise in divesting the mind of its own prejudices or attachments to mental elements in the structurally enslaved sense. Though existence is on the flow at all times, the mind and its objects seemingly are not. The mind freezes or staticizes the object of perception without being cognizant of itself and its functions as being nothing but waves, that is, visible markings in the normal flow of existence. How can one reconcile the duality of the mind, that is, one side is real and the other is relatively unreal? This, of course, is the crucial point and the ultimate message of the Buddhist philosophy of non-self or anatman, non-permanence or anitya, and the universal nature of the hindrance-ridden being or dukkha. Passage or flow of existence means that there is no objectifying or entifying of the mind itself and its objects of perception. Thus, any concept viewed abstractly, is taken to task and brought to its ultimate idiocy or self-contradiction. 